Hello, innovators. I'm Todd Wyant, and welcome to the Bridging the Gap podcast presented by Applied Software. You're invited to join our MEP and construction innovation adventure with a mission to propel this great industry forward. My guest today is Justin Sahing, head of construction technology at Stanley X, where he is responsible for the construction technology business unit, including overall strategy, building the in-house product, working with startups and venture investing, acquisitions, and more. Stanley X is the innovation division of Stanley Black & Decker, which is one of the largest tool makers in the world. Welcome to the show, Justin. Thanks for having me, Todd. Really glad and excited to be here. Yeah, looking forward to it. Let's start with how you got into the construction industry. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, You know, a while back, I I started in building my own startup. And part of it was to uh, have indoor flying drones somewhere. And we had to figure out where those drones would need to fly. And ironically enough, um, you know, that was kind of one of the areas was construction. So, you know, a good friend of mine had put me in touch with all the various construction workers that she had worked with. And we were testing out flying indoor drones that would then be able to capture the progress of the build on a daily basis. Um, And that was way before drones were actually flying indoors. A lot of that, that was actually when drones were still flying outdoors, doing a lot of the um, you know, motion graphic, you know, the motion, the movie quality, cinematic quality. Uh-huh. Uh, but we were thinking about trying to apply it indoors where there was no GPS and no signal. And so we were able to do, do that. But I think um, some of the challenges around the chaos and the environment kind of made us realize that that use case wasn't um, kind of the best kind of fit for then. And so we kind of pivoted more to kind of warehouses and uh, things like that. And so that was kind of my first foray into construction. Um, and since then, I started to work in more of the uh, tech world, building product for some of the large and startup companies um, that some of you may be familiar with, uh, and really fell in love with more of the industrial space that was still evolving and changing um, through innovation. So uh, since then, I uh, ended up getting uh, involved with Stanley X and as part of Stanley Black & Decker, realized that there was um, so much to be done uh, in construction and innovation and technology that has not yet uh, been happening and is now kind of just kind of picking back up. And uh, it's really exciting to be in the space right now. I think there's so much potential um, and I'm just honored and thrilled to be able to be a part of it um, as part of Stanley Black & Decker and Stanley X's Innovation Unit. Awesome. Nice. Yeah, I, I agree with the, the potential for sure. Uh, so one of the things about innovation is is that it's it's really kind of these small incremental steps along the way and, yeah. and learning from things that maybe didn't work exactly the way you thought. So I'm curious with your background, you mentioned about the the drones and it it not going according to how you thought originally when you set out, what were some maybe lessons learned from that experience? Oh yeah, absolutely. I think um, two key things kind of pop out. One is to start with the problem, not the technology. And I think, you know, we had a really cool drone. We just didn't know where to put it. And so there are some of the companies and, and technologies that I've seen around that are just like, oh, we have a cool thing that we're doing. How is it going to solve this problem? Mm-hmm. And you're almost kind of force fitting, um, you know, a round peg into a square hole, uh, you know, as that idiom is. But um, in some cases, you know, they might not be ready for that. I mean, we're introducing drone at a very like early stage when drones were just starting to be popular in kind of more of the entertainment industry. It wasn't even applied to any industrial industry yet. Um, and so that was the first thing that we kind of learned was just, let's go back to the problem. Like, what are we actually trying to solve? Um, and then the second thing that we learned was really to um, understand kind of the, the workflow and environment that people are working in. Like, don't just plop a solution into some nascent kind of world and expect it to work. Uh, and so we actually did fly some drones indoors. Um, we realized a couple of different issues, which was around, um, you know, signal quality, you know, even though ours could fly indoors without uh, signal, I think this is like basically being able to recognize where you are required uh, a certain fidelity of image quality that, that needs to be put in place. But that didn't, you know, ironically, that didn't pair well with kind of the physical capture of progress at that time that was required. So um, without getting into the technical details, I think there was a mismatch around that expectation. 
Uh, and part of the environment that was a challenge was there's a lot of dust that kicked up. I mean, as you expect, you have four propellers and then suddenly all this dust kind of kicks up in this kind of chaotic construction environment. And you're, you're expecting- and not ideal. <laughs> not ideal, right? You're expecting a drone to be able to fly through dust and, and self-navigate where it needs to go. Um, and, and clearly that was not a really good, great fit. And, you know, at that time and probably still now, like the drone uh, energy, you know, the battery life is roughly like 30 minutes at, at best back then. And so, you know, how far could you really fly in 30 minutes navigating kind of this chaotic environment with dust getting kicked up? And so yeah. we kind of learned from that to like, you know, quickly pivot and, and find um, an environment that was cleaner, more structured. Um, and so we found that like, you know, at that time warehousing would have been a great solution for it. So. Yeah, no, that's really interesting. I, I love the, the start with the problem, not the technology. Um, I have, I've heard this saying that I think is really good of when you're a hammer, everything is, looks like a nail to you. And so you just <laughs> beat it. And so when you start with the, the technology and just, as you said, kind of force fitting the technology yep. into a particular space, it's that hammer in search of a nail that everything is a nail. So you're just hitting random stuff and right. Right. not necessarily fixing the, the underlying problem yeah. um, which, which makes it so funny when you hear the idioms that are like oh i nailed it or oh, right. screwed, <laughs> screwed that up when it actually maybe screwing it up is actually a great thing and nailing it may not be the best thing to start with so yeah that's true <laughs> it's very true uh so one of the the problems if you i, I don't think that's the right word but uh dynamics going on in, in the industry is this relationship between the, the field and the office and and how they communicate and, and interact with each other uh and thinking through the starting with the problem not the technology and then the the environment that they work in as you referenced what are some of those um issues maybe that, that people should be aware of and, and on the the hunt to to solve with that field and office relationship yeah, absolutely. I, I think um, we've studied this area quite a bit and we have, you know, I may not have spent a lot of time in the construction world and I've visited a few construction sites to better understand, as well as their offices to understand kind of what the dynamic and relationship looks like. But I'm always a big believer in, uh, you know, the people who have that construction knowledge of being able to distill that to kind of technology solutions and trying to figure out kind of the right solution, the right way to solve it. And it may not have to be through technology, actually. Um, and so we've got the privilege to be able to spend a lot of time with some of our uh, customers as well as users and uh, even those who aren't users to really share with us some of the issues that they encounter with, you know, the field and the office and in some cases, uh, the shop, you know, the prefabrication shop. And so there's kind of this uh, Bermuda Triangle of uh, coordination issues that happen that we've found, you know, you got the three kind of environments. I've kind of technically added an environment to your question, which is the shop or the, the plant. And some, some people say, fair um, enough. <laughs> Add away. So, so you have, yeah. So you got the field and then they're waiting on things from the shop that's getting delivered. And I'm assuming in this case, there's a lot of prefabrication, which is, you know, a trend that's kind of increasing over the last decade. And then you've got the office that's kind of planning or managing a schedule and kind of coordinating the work from other deliveries that need to be there. Um, and so there's kind of three issues that we've kind of uh, found, I mean, there's plenty of issues, but, you know, I, I want to break it down pretty simply. One is there's a lot of siloed um, coordination, like siloed applications, like the shop may be using one MRP software that is not talking to, you know, the field software, which is not talking to the office software. And in some cases, the softwares are very just simple, like, uh, you know, it could be just an Excel sheet, or it could be, you know, a piece of paper that they're coordinating, or even a whiteboard that they're trying to manage. But all that information is not being coordinated uh, together in one place. Um, and so that leads to another issue, which is around the delivery and coordination. Um, and that could relate to whether it's supply chains or like the information that they had was the old schedule and now they should have gotten the new one, but it was emailed over a little bit late. Um, and, and so, you know, one, one quick thing is what we've kind of tried to build around that with our product one construct is actually to kind of coordinate that all in one place to have centralize kind of that schedule and task across these three environments to be able to use. Um, and so that's kind of one, two of the issues we encountered. Uh, and then the third thing is around data management. And so um, there's a lot of data that is being stored either on um, applications. And I, I talked about not communicating, but I think it's really finding the right data that needs to be sent over. So um, there's this awesome quote, you know, I was recently at a 
DBIA conference and they're talking about, you know, what are some of the issues that they're seeing? And one quote that really resonated with us was that not, not every issue is worth raising. Um, the owners and GCs don't, don't need to hear about every single issue. They do need to help prioritize which issue is really an issue and really needs to be addressed as soon as possible. Um, and so, you know, there's a mindset that, oh, every single data that you have, uh, let's kind of just throw it over the fence. Um, and that causes another, you know, snowball of issues. Um, but I think really finding and prioritizing the right issues to make the right decision at that time is going to be kind of um, the next kind of problem to really tackle in this space. So, mm -hmm. so it yeah. brings up an interesting thought in, in question of people throwing up every single issue over the, the fence. Does it really stem just from a CYA kind of perspective of everybody's, you know, just trying to document it, make sure that yeah. if something happened, they put it it's on paper and they can't be held responsible necessarily for it. Yeah, I think that's a really great question. I think one of it that I'm thinking about is just the lack of time, right? I don't have enough time. So I'm just going to send you all my documents and mm -hmm. I'm just going to raise everything that's an issue so that I'm going to put the um, responsibility and onus on, you know, whether this person on the field that needs to figure out like how to install this, you know, HVAC or install this piping. I don't know. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, that may be part of the equation is just, you know, I don't, I don't know. So let me just forward you everything that I got. Mm -hmm. um, the other piece may be just like, uh, like, I don't know, like, I don't know what you need. And, you know, the communication between the two may not be, you know, when I say the two, like the two environments or three environments uh, may not be like synchronized or coordinated. So I think it's best to really resolve that in a meeting. So, you know, how, like, you know, when there's a lot of thing construction going on and, uh, you know, on Monday they may need and trying to figure out what's the plan for this week, et cetera, and pull out the pool plan. I think that's probably the, the best time to raise your issues and say, hey, like this thing didn't arrive in time or, or this thing's, you know, got brought in, but, but we didn't inspect it yet. And it seems like things are wrong. So we need to send it back. You know, mm -hmm. or or you know a variety of issues. So I think it really depends. I don't I don't know if there may be one answer to say like why they kind of send everything all the data over at once. Um, and in some cases they may not send any data, right? So yeah, um, yeah. yeah. No, it's a complex issue. For yeah, sure. yeah. Not to lean into this pun. I try to avoid using this pun as much as I can. But how do you kind of bridge the gap in the the different workflows between the the physical world of the construction site? And then the the digital world of the office, because those are, I, I think that's part of the problem of, of trying to get data synced both ways. You're right. on the job site and you have your own workflow. And, you know, I, I'd like to say that they, the the paper wasn't necessarily always there, but yeah. it's a reality of the, the situation. Or, you know, you mentioned a whiteboard even of having information there. That is really difficult to get that kind of information and data over to the, the digital world that the, the office kind of resides in. Yeah, that, that is definitely a tough issue. And one of, um, you know, construction is such a multi-stakeholder landscape. Um, there's a lot of parallels with, I think, construction and even like the supply chain. Um, for example, you've got mm -hmm. the truck drivers who are, you know, shipping the work. You've got the uh, shippers that need to like send something over to here. And then you've got brokers in the middle trying to like coordinate between the two. And there's like, you know, what I learned from that is just, um, that it's, it's such a challenge to get every single stakeholder on board and get them into the digital world. And I think your question of how do you bridge the gap made me think through this a little bit more in terms of what is the definition of a gap, right? And peeling that back first. And, and so, mm -hmm. you know, a lot of people have referenced the McKinsey study in 2017, that's talking about that productivity gap of like $1.6 trillion. Um, and that, like gap, I think to peel back specifically what it means to you or to, you know, if let's assume I'm a mechanical contractor, like to understand what that gap means to me, like what is, how is that measured? Um, you know, what is that gap? Is that time wasted doing what? Um, and, and what I would start doing is really start to first, like before adopting any sort of solution is to map out the workflow uh, beginning and to end, you know, where you receive the design or maybe you are part of the design. Um, to, you know, when you start the planning process and breaking down kind of the, the procurement or the bill of materials and all that, like, where are kind of the gaps of either miscoordination or issues 
Um, and where does it all start from? Um, for us at Stanley X, when we do our innovation process, we like to call it the customer journey. Um, how do you map that customer journey? Uh, and who are kind of the stakeholders involved? And then uh, where does it all break down and what are those issues? And so once you kind of are able to understand, okay, like the handoff here or this document was always lost or this was kind of uh, the wrong information being sent, that's when you can understand, okay, how often do, the, do those issues happen, you know, and start to quantify, uh, is this wasting like true dollars and cents? You know, um, every person's time is worth money. So if, you know, one person is constantly searching or filling in the blanks in this gap, um, of the whole workflow process, then you can kind of say, okay, like by fixing kind of this accountability issue and figuring out who's supposed to be doing what, that would save us, you know, this many hours on average of a week, spending that time kind of emailing back and forth and trying to figure out like who's supposed to be doing this. And that time of like four or five hours quantifies to this much based on, you know, an hourly rate. And now you can understand, okay, multiply that by 52 weeks on a yearly basis, I'm losing this much money, right? Um, and so what I like to do is kind of breaking down that customer journey, finding those issues, finding that theme, you know, of why that those issues occur, uh, quantifying it. So then I can start to figure out what is the right solution to start to, you know, whether I need to digitize it or not, um, and, and fix the process, or is it fixed through, you know, a software? So, um, that's kind of how I would tackle, you know, bridging that gap and, and figuring that out specifically if I you know, if I had like a mechanical contractor or, or something like that. So, yeah, yeah I spot on. I, I couldn't agree with that answer more. I, uh, I bet our, our editor, Eric, is, is laughing, listening in because I kind of preach two big things of define the word that you're you're going after. So make sure everybody's on the same page. So yeah. Love, yeah. love to define the gap and then plan on the front side. I am yeah. such a big believer in map it out take the five minutes 10 minutes whatever it takes with a you know white sheet of paper and, and sketch yeah. it out map it out so that you know the direction that you're going in i don't think you can I, how do you know success unless you have it mapped out now you're just yeah. kind of aimlessly you know wandering you know yeah absolutely i think uh, a lot of folks um i think take something and start to run with it yeah, a lot of people take kind of a certain thing and then they start to run with it. You know, they, they come into a new job and they run with it and they say, okay, this is my job. I have to pull these reports. I have to like, you know, format and edit it in this way. Well, they get excited. Right. Which and then, <laughs> yeah. And then a lot of times we don't take a step back and say, well, why is it done this way? Um, what could be done better? Uh, mm -hmm. Who really needs to know? And, and what is that information really supposed to help inform the person to do? And I think, you know, one of the contractors we were talking to is like, question we should ask is what are you going to do with that information and a lot of times that's not asked it's just well someone asked for it just send it to me. And it just becomes um like this it's just we follow the process we don't question the process you know and in, yeah. certain cases, in order to digitize in order to figure out a better way you got to question that process um and so that's that's kind of why i was thinking about like well we got to break down the definition of gap and how things are run today because now you have something like you said measurable like a benchmark, you could say the, the average time it takes for me to finish this type of task actually takes me 10 hours, but five of those hours were done, you know, emailing, spent, you know, spent emailing, calling someone, trying to find things and, and figure out the right information. And so if that was reduced, maybe that could have been a five hour task instead. Right. Yeah. But you would have no idea that stat unless you took the time to think through it all and exactly. kind of flush it out. Exactly. Yes. Yeah. Perfect. Well, how do you encourage uh, and kind of gain buy-in and excitement from different stakeholders in this, uh, you know, as people are, are looking to digitize. Yeah, as I thought about this question, I was kind of putting myself in the shoes of uh, a contractor and assuming that, you know, if my organization was a little bit reluctant to embrace, whether it's a digital solution or innovation, how would I, how would I basically have stakeholder buy-in? And this uh -huh. is a a common question of influence without authority. You know, you may not be the person calling the shots, um, you know, at the organization across everyone and changing everything. Uh, but you need to figure out how to get people on board to, to want to adopt a new solution, uh, digitize a certain process, whatever you can call it. And so I, I think 
what I like to do is first put myself in the shoes of the persona. So uh, what I mean by that is who, who is the person who's kind of reluctant or needs a little bit of uh, an encouragement to move more into the, the digital aspect or innovation aspect. Uh, and so from there, I think I like to think about a couple of things. One is, you know, uh, what do they care about? You know, what is their incentive? Um, what's at stake here? And so if it's an executive, for example, it might be about, you know, I might be caring about the competition. Like who else is winning more bids than I am or more projects than I am? Uh, I, may, I might be caring about the top line revenue, you know, um, so that if I'm getting more projects, that's great. I need to figure out how to win more, or I might be caring more about my bottom line, you know, which is like the cost aspect. So what is costing me so much time and money? Like I've hired X number of workers, but I'm not doing as much as maybe my competition or the industry. So, uh, you know, understanding what they care about first is really getting the mindset and the shoes of that persona. And then second is, you know, why are they reluctant? Um, why are they afraid of change? And understanding was it something in the past that they had tried that failed, uh, or is it something? Um, is there like you know a, a mistrust in technology because you know server down? Like let's say yesterday, you know, uh, you know Facebook apps were down, and now you know, <laughs> hypothetically everyone, everyone can't post their Instagram picture in their story, right? And, and now it's like, well, do I trust the app to continue to like you know? get my get me that views or or the likes you know and maybe in some cases it's akin to construction it's like you know you, you adopted something that was on prem and and the whole server shut down and you lost all day you can't perform a project and so there's a little bit of reluctance there so um just understanding those two factors you know what do they care about why are they reluctant can help figure out how you want to address the problem so you know, I talked about it from an executive standpoint, but it could have been from a project manager if it's someone who's kind of set the project process and you're breaking that process and taking away something that they're so proud to create, how do you come alongside them to uh, make this feel like they have some ownership and skin in the game to say that they are, you know, an innovative person with them and they get a, they get a, you know, call some of the changes that are going to take place so that they still feel like they own the process, even though you're, you're kind of changing it. Um, you know, I wrote an article a couple months ago that was about like three questions to answer before selecting a construction technology startup. A lot of that circles around uh, you know, you know what we have talked about measuring, but also testing and taking small incremental proof of concepts first, um, you know, with a very clear success metric that you're willing to measure by. And then before like kind of rolling it out to the entire organization um, and, and causing issues that may, you know, be more systemic than um, isolated in, in one project case. So you're able to have a lot more control over that kind of roll out in one project instead of just saying, hey, everyone's now going to use this new software, right? Um, so I think those are some of the ways I would try to address any sort of reluctance in, in innovation within an organization. Yeah, awesome. Yeah, the, the, spot on. Uh, the psychology aspect, but that soft skill component is uh, often not a, a go-to tool in, in yeah. people's uh, arsenal, but it is yeah, it's powerful. <laughs> yeah, yeah. There's a, actually a couple of articles that say like you know people who have the most uh, influence in an organization is based on two things: uh, warmth and competence. And so you know when you start a career, you're kind of trying to show your chops by like you know doing the best work you can. Uh, but I think that warmth aspect is often neglected because we're so trained to do well in school, right? Like we just do well on our tests, we, we do standardized tests and we're just uh, measured on performance when in actuality, uh, a lot of the successful, uh, you know, people out, out there in the market, you know, a lot of them um, had either gone to where they got to based on, you know, that soft skill. Um, and so that's often something that I've been thinking about more of is just how do you build soft, soft skills uh, within teams that could help kind of for their individual career path and growth, right? So yeah. yeah, yeah, absolutely. I had a found a quote that I I like so much. I put it on a sticky note in front of me, and it's uh, I'm not here to impress. I'm here to improve, and uh, it made me think of it when you were talking about you know trying to show your chops early on yeah. in your career. Now it's uh, my let my work kind of speak for itself, and I'm gonna seek those kind of one percent improvements day in and day out and yeah let it speak for itself i don't yeah. have to be busy going around showing everybody what i've accomplished <laughs> exactly. exactly uh so what's next in the world of of contact in your mind 
Well, it's an exciting time for us right now. I mean, if you look at some of the stats, just in a, like, for example, a couple months ago, there was over 3,800 startups that are in construction tech alone. And, you know, from the timeline between 2018, 2020, uh, there was more, there's almost like $12 billion, uh, you know, in funding in the venture capital space for construction technology. So uh, it's, it's really exciting. Um, I think there's, you know, a lot of progress that still needs to be made. And to me, I think about it, you know, from the questions that you've asked in thinking about technology adoption and how to, you know, reduce some of those barriers to it. I think that's some of, you know, what a lot of companies may be struggling with or trying to figure out. And I think uh, to me, what's next is, um, you know, there's always going to be a lot of these point solutions right now, right? We The, the number 3,800 or whatever is, is really largely comp comprised of, you know, point solutions that are solving one thing. So as mm -hmm. an example, maybe, um, you know, one company solves, you know, procurement or one company solves, uh, you know, reporting or payments, right? And these point solutions, um, you're, we're starting to see the trend of acquisitions. Like a lot of companies are starting to buy these point solutions up. You know, we just saw Procore buy a level set, right? To now create a payments arm uh, for possibly their platform. Um, and I think like a lot of platforms from a technology aspect will start to emerge, you know, and, and you know, right now we see some of the big three, you know, platforms out there in, in the space, but there's going to be medium sized one, small sized one. And I don't believe this is a one winner takes all. I think it's going to be a, um, as they say, an oligopoly, you know, uh, which means, you know, there's few players that will dominate the space. Mm -hmm. uh, and so we're going to see a lot of these platform plays that comprise of different business models, such as, you know, SaaS, like software as a service. There's going to be marketplaces, B2C direct plays, uh, training platforms. Um, I think that's going to start to emerge in the you know, next two, three years-ish. Uh, and that's mostly from a software aspect that I'm talking about. From a hardware aspect, I think we're going to see a little bit longer timeline, I think primarily because we're now in the space of proof of concept. A lot of folks are trying out AR, robotics, you know, 360 degree cameras. I think that one's actually got a little bit of more uh, runway because it's, you know, it's been there for a while. There's a few other players, you know, who are doing similar things. Um, and 3D printing is just starting to take off as well. We see companies like Icon, you know, doing some you know, really interesting things with residential as well as with large, you know, with the government in, you know, 3D printing spaces. So um, I think the hardware one will take a little bit longer to scale. Um, I think right now we're going to see more people being willing to try out hardware technologies like ro robots that will help automate layouts or do rebar tying. Um, those are all really interesting, but they're all starting to get proved out. And I think when, what I mean by proved out, we need to kind of go back to measure, um, you know, what it means to be successful in proving it out. You know, just because I try a robot that, that lays out in like, you know, this amount of time, could I have done that manually, you know, with reduced time? So how does that compare? You know, so I think that is, uh, that is kind of what else, what I think we'll start to see in next for construction tech and, and more construction players um willing to try new things and start to roll it out for the organization so yeah yeah nice yeah. if you could kind of snap your fingers and innovate one thing in the industry what would you do Ooh, that's a tough one um you know one thing that i think would be really interesting i don't know what the solution would be but i think if i could snap my finger to innovate something I think it would be an automated way to diagnose the sustainability of a building. Hmm. And what I mean by that is, you know, I think sustainability is another one of those trends that's going to come up and start to come into the construction tech space. Uh, but a lot of the assessment and things that are done is kind of like through the process. That makes sense. It's not like, mm -hmm. it's not at the end. I think it'd be really interesting to inventory kind of all the buildings that we have today with a simple scan that says, this one is a, you know, X percent green based on, you know, you know, what I know about, you know, I, I don't know how you're going to get that data, but I think it'd be really interesting to do it quickly and be able to say like X is number in compliance. Cause I think sustainability laws and regulations are going to start to take place. And, and we're going to have to kind of figure out along the way, like, Oh, can't use these materials or we can't, can't use this type of uh, methodology to like kind of build it. Um, we're going to have to figure out, okay, like these are not in compliance. What do we need to re redo uh, with this building? So 
that's already no. built anyway. So I think that'd be kind of interesting. That's really so like a, a scan of the building after it's done and yeah. they kind of ranked it on the sustainability scale. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And, nice. and yeah, I think that'd be kind of interesting. I I haven't like really looked into it, but that just kind of came up to my mind just now. So yeah. No, that's cool. Um, one, one of the things I find kind of interesting is around t- tool tracking. Uh, and so we've got this, we've got a product called Tool Connect uh, and Site Manager, which allows you to track where your tools are on the job site and actually even assets. So you've got a DeWalt tag that allows you to track the location of things like, you know, your, your crib or your, um, you know, you know, other large objects, even equipment. You can figure that out on you know, our, our site manager, which tracks kind of where things are. Um, and that's kind of an interesting thing that we've been innovating for on the tools side, on the DeWalt side. Uh, the other aspect is um, we've got kind of uh, a design software that's integrated with, uh, you know, Revit called Hangerworks, which helps with the layout of, you know, hangers, um, which I think is also another innovative approach that we had take, uh, taken a couple of years ago um, to innovate in the space more from a design perspective. I'd love to actually also ask, you know, what are you seeing in the space? Yeah, I, I think that, so going back to kind of the, the field and office yeah. dynamics, I think that would be an interesting place to beef up more on a, kind of two factors, the, the communication between them and getting some platform that made that easier. Uh, and then on the data portion of it as well too. Yeah. I think one of the issues in construction from my vantage point is that there's just so much data that's being thrown out there and people are like, uh, I got to collect everything, but they don't know what to do with it after, or like the, yeah. the purpose behind the data or like what, why is it relevant for these different stakeholders? And so some kind of platform I'm totally thinking off the top of my head right now, uh, but some platform that helped to kind of disseminate those in buckets yep. and so that people only really saw what was applicable to their particular roles because yeah. they're, so they're not overwhelmed by all the, the data that's, that's out there, but they get easy access to, <clears throat> excuse me, that the data that is relevant for them. So if you had some sort of role parameters that you could set up. Yeah. Yeah. We, we kind of see that problem as well. And I think, um, you know, there's, uh, there's data that has not been classified yet and there's classified data and, and trying, I think one of the first steps is to figure out, like, I think to your point, that's like a really hard issue to solve. And I, I love that you brought it up because, um, I think we're, we're just like at the tip of it is just to, to figure out how do you even classify this data, right? Like mm-hmm. what should it be categorized in? Um, and, and a lot of the historical data is just not there. Unfortunately, it's just all been done on, on paper or whiteboards that are erased, you know, day in, day out. And, um, and yeah. things are printed out honestly and handed over. So we gotta, we gotta first figure out like, the, like you said, the types of data that are floating out there and go from there. So, um, that's really good input. Thanks. Yeah. Yeah. Well, how do people find out more information on Stanley X and, and connect with you? Yeah, absolutely. Um, we've got our website, stanleyx.com, that kind of talks about the different areas we're looking into. And we've got different verticals, as we like to call them, that focus on improving kind of the space that we serve with our current customers who buy our DeWalt drills and, you know, Craftsman drills and all that. And so we've got construction as one, manufacturing as another, and kind of talent training as another. Um, and those are the three kind of areas that we have today. Uh, if you want to learn more about our product, oneconstructpro.com, what I mentioned earlier is one of the products that we've launched recently that helps with coordinating across, you know, prefab shops, the office and the field. So oneconstructpro.com, um, and you can learn more about that. Uh, you can always connect with me on LinkedIn. Um, and we always, we, we also recently acquired a company named buildup.co, which is a digital punch list that automates, you know, checking for issues and quick tasks on site um, that we've got a number of customers using already out in the market. So um, we're really excited by some of the things that we're doing. And this is just kind of the beginning of, you know, what we've been doing for Stanley Black & Decker Construction Tech, but um, absolutely excited that we get to share this with you all. Awesome. 
Well, yeah. last question for you. What does innovation mean to you? Uh, I think innovation is really the ability to take a novel concept that improves a certain problem, regardless of methodology, and be able to commercialize it. And what I mean by that is there's ideation, which you have an idea and a concept, but it may not make it to the market, but innovation is the ability to take it through um, and actually offer it to the market in a commercial way. So, yeah. Nice. I love the, the difference between ideation and innovation there. So I, I always ask my guests that that question is the, the final question. And, uh, you know, two years into this, I'm still amazed at the new perspectives of innovation that come up. So I like that. I think that's a great distinction.